Wearing number 50, Steve Mix, spent nine of his 13 NBA seasons as a 76er. And in 2005, as my color analyst, Mix made sure to tell Allen Iverson, after Allen scored a career-high 60 in a game, that Mix once scored more than that. Didn't you play a game <laughs> with a team in a prison and you had like 70 points or oh, something? Oh, you remember like that. that? When you yeah, of course. Oh, I, oh, I, I, more I, more I there's more. There's more to. Tell me that. Tell me that story I again. Oh, I, I scored more than. Uh, um, Iverson scored that night, and, and he said, well, "Where you never scored more than that?" I said, "Yeah, I had 75." And you asked me, and I said, "Yeah, I played in at uh, Milan State Prison. I, I was on the visiting team, fortunately." <laughs> and, uh, Up next, my broadcast partner for 13 fun and fascinating seasons of Sixers basketball, the Mayor Steve Mix on Fresh 24. Sixers lock all windows and doors. Steve Mix, we got a lot to catch up on, brother. <laughs> it's been but a while, man. It's been a lot. It's been a, it's, it's been a minute. You and I spent a lot of time together in the trenches. I think we did over a thousand games together. Yeah, but I agree. I think we did. For the thousandth time in your life, you got to explain the nickname, the mayor. There are a lot of people out there, probably some young people have no idea. How did you get the nickname, the mayor? Well, you know, what's funny about that is now that I'm coaching in the big three and I get introduced they introduced me as the mayor as well in the big three. <laughs> Doc, I think Doc ended up putting all that together. But way back in the day, uh, when Bill Campbell was doing uh, the broadcast back in the uh, mid '70s or so, uh, my spot on the floor was the right side of the floor, and and uh, the interesting thing that was where my jump shots came from, my post up moves. Uh, and then when we got Doc, Doc was always on the left side, so it worked out perfectly. Doc's on the left side, I'm on the right side. And Bill Campbell, I had a pretty big area when, when he started doing I had that whole right side thing, and then as you get older, the town, and the, then it becomes a community, then it becomes uh, a lot smaller in the day. But uh, Bill Campbell was the one that uh, put that together and, and uh, called me the mayor of Mixville uh, because that was where I was most effective. The late, great Bill Campbell, one of my broadcasting idols. He's on yeah. my Mount Rushmore. Let me ask yeah. you, coaching in the big three, is that uh, <laughs> legit or are you just sort of there to be Steve Mix? No, it's interesting because six years ago, I was coming back from a uh, – uh, I, was, I, I was ushering the New York Mets uh, spring training games, and I was driving home after a game, and I got a call from Doc, and, and Doc said, Steve, Ice Cube is uh, getting ready to start a, uh, a summer league, three-on-three -three summer league, and uh, I want to know if you want to be my assistant. And uh, I thought, well, let me check my schedule. And, boy, you know, I had every other you know, summer <laughs> entirely open. So, uh, so we became, uh, he was the head coach. I'm the assistant coach. Doc does a great job of what he does. And I'm the guy that draws up the offense and, and does some stuff on defense. We put it out to the players and let them decide what they want to do. And we got a really great group of players with Jason Richardson, who was with the Sixers at one point. And, and uh, um, we all kind of decide on what we want to do, how we want to handle players, what we want to do defensively and offensively. And it works out exceptionally well that way. So back in the day, you have a great career at the University of Toledo. You're a Toledo kid. You're a fifth-round pick. They had 10 rounds back then in the NBA draft. I won't go into that, but are you surprised you went 13 years in the NBA being, of all things, a fifth-round pick? Uh, no, I, not really. I mean, I, you know what? I never gave it a whole lot of thought because ever since um, I was growing up I'm in the driveway, playing in the driveway, I was always one guy or the other. I was either – uh, Havlicek and, and Russell or uh, Sam Jones or somebody like that. And then out west, you're, you're Wilt or, or uh, Jerry West and Elgin and stuff like that. So you're always playing. You're always there. You're always playing against these guys or you're, you're, you're playing with them in, in your own mind. 
Um, and in high school, I just started to improve a little bit. In college, I had a, had a great coach, and, and uh, Bob Nichols worked on a lot of footwork stuff. And, and uh, you know, I, I just played. That's all I did was I played basketball uh, from the time I was in junior high all the way through college. And the, the, the hard part was making it to the NBA, and I was there for two and a half years. And uh, then I got cut five times. So the hard part <laughs> is trying to figure out what's preventing me from being successful in the sport that I, I, I want to play in. And for me, it was a simple jump shot from 18 feet, and that's where kind of Mixville ended up starting to go out a little bit. And Butch Colmeyer is a friend of mine who played for the Pistons as well, took me under his wing, and we worked on jump shots. We worked on footwork. We worked on how to hold the ball, how to bring your arm straight up into the shooting pocket, et cetera, et cetera, and the follow-through and the fingers pointing at the rim. And uh, from that point on, it was like, okay, all you got to do is just keep shooting it the same way every single time. Now, our goal was to make seven out of ten from the five spots out on the floor, from the baseline, the wings, and the top of the key. Uh, when I first started, I was probably making four or five. And then by the time I finished my 13 year, I was probably eight, nine, sometimes ten uh, from those mm-hmm. five spots. So I was getting pretty good at little 18 foot jump shots. Uh, you and I shared a lot of stories over the years, and I think it was relatively early in your career. It might have been that one year you spent in the CBA after you got cut by Earl Lloyd in Detroit. Didn't you play a game <laughs> with a team in a prison and you had like 70 points or oh, something? Oh, you remember like that. that? That's when you said, Yeah, of course. Never, oh, I, oh, I got it. There's more. There's more to. Tell me that story I said, again. Oh, I, I scored more than uh, um, Iverson scored that night. And, and you said, where you never scored more than that? I said, yeah, I had seventy-five, and you asked me, and I said, yeah, I played in at uh, Milan State Prison. I, I was on the visiting team, fortunately, <laughs> and uh, I ended up with seventy-five that night. In fact, they had to change the betting uh, in the prison when they found out who I was. So the cigarettes were worth a lot more than than they were before I showed up. <laughs> By the way, um, uh, you actually crossed paths and played against Will Chamberlain. Uh, I did. He's at the end of his career. You're very early in yours, your Detroit days. What was that like? Um, I played against him a couple times. Uh, it was interesting. So we're in Detroit, and we're pushing the ball up the court. Wilt's underneath the bucket. I was wide open. I took a jump shot from the right side. Obviously, this is one of the reasons why I worked on my jump shot. I miss the jump shot. Next time down, Dave Bing throws me a ball. I miss another jump shot. Bush Van Breda call, calls the timeout. He says, see, why are you shooting those jump shots? I said, I was open. He said, you ever think there's a reason why you were open? <laughs> so the th- third time I caught it, I, I drove it to the hoop. And Will comes out, and he tries to block my shot. And I gave a little finger roll over the top of his fingers. And it hit the top of the rim. And I started rolling down the top of the backboard and fell through the net. Now, what do I do? I got to run down the court like, yeah, I knew what I was doing, right? I knew, <laughs> I knew that shot was going to go in. So there we are. <laughs> you know, you and I always used to talk about the fact, and, t- and today, uh, you know, fighting is virtually extinct in, in, in NBA games where guys throw fists and all that stuff. There's probably some stuff that happens in practice now and then. But the way you tell it, it sounded like, Back in your day, fighting was almost as common as it is in hockey. It was a t- it was a twenty five dollar technical play on. Oh, so uh, it was, sometimes it was worth twenty five bucks just to well, get a punch I mean, in. Yeah, I, I, I tell Rick Mahorn all the time now because when he played with uh, Lambeer, I said, you know, you're you're lucky that that Lambeer didn't play back in the day because he would have been pummeled every single night with the with his tactics and somebody would have, would have hit him every night. And my very first exhibition game. I got in a fight with Luke Jackson. Okay. Hal, Hal Greer's coming down the floor to the middle, and Luke's coming off his Achilles tendon pull. He's on the left side. And I hear my coach say, take the charge, take the charge. You know, my college coach says, take the charge. Here he comes. Luke hit me, knocked me down. He stands up and said, rookie, if you ever take a charge again, I'm, not, I'm going to knock your head off. <laughs> oh, very, very next play. Here comes Hal. Here comes Luke down the left side. The coach says, take the charge. Take the charge. <laughs> so I stood in there and I took the charge. As I got up, Luke's taking a shot at me. 
whoo, big fist coming across, <laughs> just missed. Somebody grabbed Luke. Nobody grabbed me. Oh, and I'm like, let him go. Let him go. Don't let him go. Let him go. Don't let him go. You know? <laughs> so it was like, phew, my first one. By the, by the way, I got to tell the young kids, Luke Jackson was 6'9", 250, and he yeah, was chiseled. Yeah. He was like Wilt's bodyguard back yes, in the day, was. as yes, if Wilt even was. needed one. Yeah, yeah, he was huge. I mean, he, just a big, strong guy. He had a great career, a lot of years in Philadelphia. And uh, that, that was like a major surprise when he took a swing at me. But, <laughs> oh, well, you live and learn. So you're joining a Sixers team that the year before in 1973 went nine and 73. It's the worst 82 game record in NBA history. And you're getting some playing time until 1976 when a certain somebody signed with the team. Tell the story of you and Julius Irving. Well, yeah, that was interesting because uh, I was an all star the year before. And, 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 you know, George McGinnis was on the team and all of a sudden, we're, we're, we, I think we won every single game in, in uh, exhibition season. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing these rumors like, well, Julius Serving, who's Julius Serving? Well, I guess we're going to sign him. I don't know who he is. Uh, but here he comes in, and uh, you know, he has big fro and all that kind of stuff. And, and he was making a lot more money than I was, and Jordan McGinnis was making a lot more money than I was. And let's see, the guy making less money – is coming off the bench. <laughs> so, so it was George and Doc. And, um, you know, first year, well, every, every year that, that I was on a team, our wives sat together. So then all of a sudden, because our wives sat together, now we become friends. And that was 76. So we've been together, what, 24, almost 50 years, right? And, and you and Doc uh, were, were were you guys roommates when we were, being we were having roommates a roommate for, was like going out of style years. by then? Yeah. We were roommates for seven years. We were the only two guys on the team in the room together. Hmm. And the, the fun part about that was we out of the meal money we put five dollars a night into a kitty, so we could like we could upgrade to a suite if we wanted to. We were in L.A. one night and Doc and I rented a limo. And the limo pulls up behind the bus. <laughs> We're standing next to the limo. And Billy comes out and says, hey, the bus is leaving. Let's go. <laughs> we got in the limo. Now, it was only, what, <laughs> three, four blocks away to the, to the, uh, to the arena. <laughs> we, we pull off with the bus. We get out of the limo. Billy looks at us like, what the heck are you guys doing? <laughs> but we had five extra bucks. We could run a limo and do this stuff. So that was cool. Tell the story about answering the phone in the hotel room when you guys oh, were in the boy. hotel room together. Oh, he got, I would, there, there were calls all the time. All the time. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why I was his roommate, too, because I was like uh, Ma Bell, right? So I would answer the phone because he would never answer, and it would ring forever. One night I, I answered the phone, and uh, somebody asked for Julius. And I Oh, you want Julius? Sure. Here you go. Talk to here's Julius now. Talk to him. So I hand him the phone, and he he, he hung up immediately. He said, "Don't do that anymore." <laughs> but in, I mean, he got yeah. But didn't didn't you at didn't you at one point you impersonated him? Didn't you? I did. I did. And uh, uh, let me hear the, let me hear the impression. Let me hear how it went. Hello, this is Julius. How, <laughs> how are you? Yeah, yeah. How, you know, you, then you kind of ramble on. Hello, this is Julius. Uh, oh, yeah. How are you tonight? Yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm doing really well. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> – and he's, he's looking at me. He's laughing his rear end off, right? It's like, that doesn't sound too bad, but <laughs> – so uh, you're with the Sixers. You went to three finals, 77, 80, and 82. Yeah, yeah. And the 77 one it was really the most intriguing because here you are. You're playing Bill Walton in Portland. It's a best of seven. You got home court. You're up 2 nothing. But right before that second win at the Spectrum was the fight between a couple of guys who are no longer with us and Daryl Dawkins and Mo Lucas. Uh, in your opinion, it seems to be the opinion of many, that 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 seemed to turn the series around it it may have tu- it may have turned it around but here's what i know about that fight the only guy that got hit was doug collins 
Right. Daryl, in a wild swing, popped Doug in the jaw. <laughs> now, and th- and those guys, those guys were really they were you know they were really getting thought they were getting after him. A couple punches thrown, both guys were thrown out. Daryl goes in and rips the toilet out of this out of the wall. Water everywhere. <laughs> so I mean, it was like okay. So anyway, so that that guy, we 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 were the better players they had the better team and the better team won you know they won they went back one two there um and then won at our place and then wrapped it up at their place but it, you know it's still the, the funny thing about that was the last shot in portland when gene ended up uh telling george mcginnis that he wanted him to take the shot I don't know. I forget how many Doc had. Doc was hot. Doug Collins was hot. And I guess we were going to trick Portland into letting George take the last shot. You know, George had that one-handed, funky mm-hmm. little shot of his, right? And we were all like, you know, where? what was the guy's name from uh, uh, Hoosiers? The guy, last guy, Jimmy, Jimmy, uh, yeah, whatever his last name is, right? I wanted somebody to step up and say, Chitwood? Me, was yeah. it Chitwood? Chitwood, Jimmy Chitwood, yeah, um, or Bobby Plump, whoever you want to, whoever who was the original guy. But Jimmy Chitwood says, "I'll make the shot." I wish somebody would have stepped up and said, "No, I'll make the shot." But nobody ever did. George took the shot, missed it, came up short, and uh, Portland wins. Talking about stepping up and making a shot, I remember. I guess Billy Cunningham was coaching. You were you were probably out of the rotation. You would only get into the game if you were losing by thirty or winning by thirty. And there was wasn't that there, there was one one game where he put you in. And what was your statement to him? Well, we were we were down by thirty maybe. So I run up to him. That was <laughs> when we had the snap on pants and the tops, right? So I ran up to him faced him, looked at him, and ripped off my pants, said, Billy, you want me to win this thing or just tie it up for you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, at, at that particular time, he was extremely upset about the way the game was going. And <laughs> he said, oh, <laughs> what am I going to do, right? Now, you you got to start laughing a little bit. Yeah, make light of it. You're down by 30. It's one game. You got 80, 80 some more to go or whatever. You know, 40 more to go, 30 more, whatever it is. But Every once in a while, you take a beating and you move on from there. Throw the tape away. Nobody wants to watch it and doesn't do anybody any good to watch that tape. Check out our friends over at Philadelphia Sports Nation, a local Philadelphia sports site covering your favorite teams across blogs and social media. PHLSportsNation.com. Philadelphia Sports Nation. PHL Sports Nation. Enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience. Yep. Uh, you know, the thing that was, uh, I, I thought, um, a, an ironic twist certainly was here you are with the Sixers, you go to three NBA finals, 83, they finally win it. And what happens? You're sitting on the Lakers bench, the team that lost the finals to, uh, the Sixers in 83. What do you remember about that? Well, Kareem said on the, on the bus ride to the airport, he said, Steve, we're going to win a championship for you. All right. Hey, that sounds good. <laughs> you know, I can go with that. But the interesting thing about that whole thing, that's when James Worthy went down. Uh, I broke his leg uh, in, in a game or practice, whatever. So I go out to L.A. They you broke me. his leg or he broke his leg? He broke it. He okay, broke fine. his leg in a game. I'm not sure how right. he did it. But so anyway, we're, we're uh, Bill Sharman called me up and said, Steve, I'd like you, to, like you to come to L.A. I was in Milwaukee at the time. I'd retired from Milwaukee. I called it a day. And so I, I'm in Milwaukee closing everything up. Bill Sharman calls me and says, Steve, we need you to come out. James Worthy ended up breaking his leg. We want you to come out and fill in. So I go out and sign with the Lakers. Um, and so nicest group of guys you want to meet. Like That was a team, just like the Sixers were a team when I was there. They were a team. Um, asked me to go wherever they went. See if you'd like to come along. Sure, I'd love to. Went to dinner, went to movies, et cetera, et cetera, with them. Um, so we're going out there. And, and the first pass from Magic, like Mo Cheeks threw soft passes, but they were always on time. They'd hit you right in the hands. Magic would come across. He would, you know, he boom, he's got those hard passes. The first one I caught, hit my hands, bounced to the floor. I'm like, I better be a little bit ready for his passes. But yeah, right. I thought, I thought, you know, 
and, and Moses said four, four, four. And uh, so you go from there. But they won. Congratulations to Doc and the 76ers and all that. And I, I signed for a double playoff check and I made more money than the Sixers made. <laughs> <laughs> so that was good. <laughs> Speaking about retirement, do you remember when I asked you, Steve, how did you know it was time to retire? Do you remember what you said to me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was easy. That was, my last year, a shot was taken from the left corner. I had my man boxed out. Long shot, produced long rebounds, hit the front of the rim, bounced over the rim. I looked up. Now, I can't, I can't tell you exactly what I said, but... There was probably a few profanities in there. As I looked up, the ball was coming down. It was a little bit over my head. I had the man boxed out, no problem. Jump up, get the rebound. I looked up and said, oh, I'll get the next one. No, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you the way the story went. Here's what well, you did. I, 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 I have a funnier version. I have I a funnier version. use the words and, and, that I Well, said, I'm, I'm going to use it because we're not under FCC regulations okay, here, right. and it's perfectly <laughs> fine. So I just remember I said, Steve, how did you know it was time for you to retire? And you said to me, when that rebound's available, and you say, fuck it, let somebody else get it. I did say that. Yeah, I did say <laughs> that. Yeah, I didn't, know, I didn't know whether I could use that or not, but um, you were right. That's exactly what yes. I said. And, and, I'm and running that, the show here. You could say at, whatever at you want. At that point, you know it's time to go. There's always a point in a career where it doesn't matter what it is. The player will look, whether it's baseball, football, soccer, doesn't matter, basketball. You're like, man, it, it's time to go. Mm-hmm, exactly. Um we worked 13 years together. We yeah. did over a thousand games. And, you know, I think about it, we're, we're uh, essentially very different people, whether it's religion, our upbringing, our politics, yet we really seem to have good chemistry. Why do you think we had such good chemistry? Well, yeah, we, we knew what each other's job was. And I think that's half the battle. I don't think we stepped on each other. You, you did what you did. And I, I tried to take it from time the ball was made or missed to half court. Um, and you can describe the play that's going on there. I'll take it from there again. And, and I think from that standpoint, once we figured out what we had to do, um, things, things proved to be pretty effective, I thought. Yeah, and I just remember a lot of times I would, like, give you, like, half a sentence uh, – you know, and you would you would finish the sentence. I mean, it, it really it truly was a lot of fun. Um, I, I I need to uh, ask you to tell the story of what happened in Portland with Greg Anthony. I want you to give your version of it. <laughs> I, I, I know that I have my version. I have to tell you, Steve, I, I, I don't know what year that was, uh, late 90s, early yeah. 2000s. But if that happened today, we'd both be world famous, okay? Because there was no, there was no internet then. There was, yeah, no, there was no social no media. No, nobody but filmed it. I, I know I have my version. I'm going to let you tell your version. Go ahead. We're in so Portland. Anthony, Sixers are playing the Trailblazers. Yep, he's coming down. Greg Anthony playing for the Trailblazers. He's walking down the court, getting ready to check in. And I'm not sure why he walked past us, but he did. And on the way past us, he spit. Now, I'm sure he meant to spit on the advertising board in front of him. However, there was a loogie that came across the top of, of the scores table on us. I don't know if you you remember that or not, but... Oh, yeah. I, 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 vividly, yeah. like it happened and, last and, night. So the next thing, <laughs> I'm like, Greg Anthony just spit on us. And he looked at us and mouthed a few words. And as he spit on me and he said something... I stood up and grabbed the back of my chair. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to whack you with my chair if you decide to come over over the top. But he's <laughs> mouthing off at you and you're mouthing off at him. And I think of, you took your headset off at one point, yeah, right? I did. I did. And I, like he's cussing at me. And as I said, I, I picked up, I stood up, grabbed the back of my chair. If he comes over the top, <laughs> poor guy. And then... <laughs> He walks down and Larry Brown says, man, it's a good thing you didn't mess with that guy. <laughs> so the following morning, I get a call. I have no idea what was going to take place. Following morning, I get a call from the NBA about 7 o'clock in the morning. And it was it was the, um, what would you say, the security office uh, mm-hmm. of the NBA. And he said, what what happened last night? I said, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't 
find Greg Anthony at all. It's, I'm trying to like protect my rear end, right? I wouldn't find Greg Anthony. No, I went in and saw Jimmy Jackson. Jimmy Jackson introduced me to Greg Anthony, and we straightened the whole thing out. Everything's cool. Don't worry about it. Don't find him. So we hung up, and it's like, I, I don't know if they find him or not, but it was like, <laughs> oh, man, it was, it, was, it was not good. But I, you know, I'm just thinking – you know that that would have gone around the world in like five minutes. Oh, I know. Seriously, yeah. I mean, but, people would have posted that. It would have been crazy. All right. Yeah. Um, so, 1996, we're doing the games, and uh, Allen Iverson is drafted. And quite frankly, with the way he played and his styling and all the rest, um, you know, he was new school, and you were a decidedly old school kind old of guy. School. How did you sort of have to adjust your thinking once he came onto the team? Well, I mean, he was a tremendous individual player, you know, and there were four defensive players around him. You know, um, you ended up what was Matumbo on that team and George Lynch and Eric Snow, right? I forget who, yep. the, who the other Tyrone, was. Tyrone Hill. Tyrone Hill. So there's four defensive players around him. All those guys could score, what, 8 to 12, 14 points a game. I mean, there was no 20-point score on that team. Um, and he, he was, he was the new style. And you see that in Harden and all these guys today that they, they want to make their individual moves. And he was one of the first guys to be able to do that. And, you know, fans, fans love him. They, they love that style of ball. And, and, uh, you know, for me, it's pass the ball, making, you know, set screens, come off the screens, a couple extra passes, um, get the best shots you can, and not one guy dribbles it for 18 to 20 seconds. Um, so that was that was hard for me to, to to grasp and get a hold of. But you know, guys, there's all sorts of guys doing it today, and and Allen was the first guy to do it. And as I said, when you grow up in the 60s and and you get it into the post and you try to kick it out and set some screens and weak side movement and stuff like that. It was just Allen going one on one with uh, whoever he could. Eventually, he would pass it, but once again, you're talking with four or five, six seconds left on the shot clock, and it's not a lot of time to make a move if you're the guy receiving the pass. Do uh, you watch much of the game today? I watch a little bit of it. I don't watch much of it. I watch some of the Sixers this year in the, in the playoffs and stuff. And it, uh, if, I, if, I, if I was Maury, I would get the most I could with uh, uh, Harden. I'd have a hard time playing with him if, if he was on my team. Um, I think he dribbles way too much. And he's a 20 and 10 guy. So how many 20 and 10 guys are there in the league? However, you take a look at his, his, his playoff numbers. Those are down. And B's numbers were down. I think Embiid was tired this year toward the end of the last couple of games. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there as I'm, I'm thinking of the team. Do I move Maxi to the point? And is Harris better without Harden? Probably. Um and then, and then you sign Patrick Beverly, um, Tucker, 38 years old. He's probably past his prime when it comes to playing some too good solid defense, but he's a good guy coming off the bench for a little bit. You need to replace him as a starter and Embiid the MVP last year. It was down to him and Jokic. So uh, I was glad to see Embiid get it. I, Doc and I talked about that. I thought Embiid was the better player during the regular season. Uh, Julius Irving, when you say Doc, yeah. not Doc Rivers. There's only one Doc. Now you see here. You, well, you, yeah, you, yeah. You, listen, you I I started that. I started that, and I had to eat crow. And Doc Rivers was hired as the head oh, coach. Yeah, I had to can. sort of say to him, "Hey, I didn't mean anything bad by it, but I was always referring to him as Glenn Rivers when he was yeah. coaching the Clippers and the or, Celtics or coach, because there was only Rivers one Doc in Philly. Better. I agree with you. Yeah, there's only one Doc. So when somebody says, "Oh, Doc," no, no, you can't. <laughs> right. <for> me. No, <laughs> I, dude, I'm with, I am I am with you on that. Uh, so uh, you're a Toledo guy through and through. You're retired now. You're living in Florida, and you made a lot of headlines because you're an usher at Mets spring <laughs> training games. <laughs> yeah, did, did you have anything better to do? <laughs> well, it was interesting because a, a good friend of mine is the uh, equipment manager for the Tigers. I've known him uh, since we lived in Toledo and Perrysburg and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, our kids went to school together, and I've known this uh, uh, this guy for a long, long time. So he called me up and said, hey, here you're moving to Florida. You want a job? I said, no, well, I don't want a job. Yeah, he right. Said, well, I said, what are you thinking of? He said, well, there's some ushering. There's some teams around you where you're going down here in Vero Beach that maybe you'd like to be an usher. 
So, and I said, well, that, that, that might, might be good because it's only the month of March and there's about 14, 15 games or something like that. It's not, not, not an overload on the work. Uh, so his, his boss called the Mets. The Mets called the uh, St. Lucie Mets. The St. Lucie Mets called me and said, Steve, I hear you're looking to be an usher for, for us down here at spring training. Come on down. Let's talk. Now, they put me right behind home plate. That's the spot you want to be if you're an Why usher. is that? Why is well, that? Well, you're first of all, you're in the shade. And you're, and, <laughs> okay. and, and you're guard and you're guarding and you're guarding that you, the aisle you're guarding is where all the VIPs are. So all the people that are coming, you can't let anybody down that aisle uh, that's not a VIP. So I look like to be the guy at six, 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 seven to say, okay. You're not allowed down here. Yeah, but I know. No, oh, you don't know. You don't know the owner. You, you don't know uh, the general manager. No, just keep on moving. I just want to get a pick. No, not today. So yeah, right. that was my job. I did that for uh, five or six years, and this year I didn't do it. I did it last year because of the strike. There was only like six games. I figured I could do six games. Um, it worked out perfectly. And then the uh, Major League Baseball sent us a check because – we got ripped off on the games because of the strike, so we got an extra bonus check from the Major League Baseball. Well, <laughs> listen, um, I, I, I got to let you go because you, you got to prepare for this big three season coming up, right? I got my I got my scouting report all done. I I, I literally I watched I watched the team we're playing like three times. I jot down all their plays. I jot down the players, which way they like to drive, what what they like to do going left, what they like doing going right. The plays are running that uh, that we can stop. Um, so I mean, it's a lot of fun, and the uh, players I think enjoy it. Uh, they enjoy playing with Doc anyway, and and uh, we have a good time doing it. And the good thing about our team is Tri State. They listen to what we have to say. We we're kind of in uh, conjunction with each other on on what needs to be done and how they want to play it and how we want to play it. And eventually we all come to the same agreement. You don't use, <laughs> I'm laughing as I ask it. You don't, you don't use analytics, do you? <laughs> no, there's no such thing. You know what? It, and, and I think, I think that's a bunch of garbage. If you, if you, <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, okay. Can a guy play or can he play? Here's my analytics when I play. What's the guy's first move? Because his first move is always his favorite move. If I stop that, will he be able to come back and go the other way? Uh, can he shoot the outside shot? What's he like to do in the low post? I mean, it's not like it's rocket science. It's, it's you know, these players watch all these game films and stuff like that. Like, you don't need to. Just, it's your guy. First of all, they're not guarding anybody because they're switching on everything. Billy told me one day, if you can't guard that guy, you're coming out. And that was Marcus Johnson from Milwaukee. I knew I couldn't guard him. So I, I, I had to follow him out, which I did because I couldn't guard him. But <laughs> things you have to do to be successful, just know your game and the opponent's game. And it, life is easy. Steve Mix, it was too short. I'm going to let you go. <laughs> Uh, I know you got things to do, uh, maybe even grandkids around. I don't know. But, brother, it was great getting to speak to you again. You Let's do it, it again soon. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You, you got to Take care. Yeah. Have a good one. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of Fresh 24. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts.